So meeting, we'll start with a roll call. Lambert. Here. Tunic. Here. Pritchett, um, Sean, I did pass the host. Thank you. Uh, Pritchett. Here. Bevins. Here. W. Erickson. W. Erickson. T. Erickson. Here. Johnson. Here. So with that, we're looking for the approval of the agenda. I think we'll have two changes. One, I think we should postpone the community member of the month till next meeting like we just spoke about. And Jennifer, do you know if Bruce Buxton did or is calling in? Sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, I do not know if and asked if he was going to be attending. He said he was going to call in. Well, should we move the parking commission up to the top or leave it where it is? I would say move it up. Well, I guess it's up to you, Mr. President. I know you had somebody who was going to attend and now she is not going to be here. You know, I, I think it's fine where it is, but I would defer to you. Yeah, well, I think we can leave that where it is since Bruce isn't on the line. So I think we'll, the one change I'd like to see is uh, postpone the community member of the month one meeting. Uh, move to approve the agenda with the postponement of the community member of the month till our next meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda with one change. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Aye. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. That motion carries. Next up is the consent calendar. Notice to public, all matters listed are considered routine by the council and will all be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to the time the council votes on the motion to be adopted by roll call. Mr. Chair, Mr. President, I uh, move to approve the consent calendar. Lambert. Second, Bevins. We have a motion by Lambert, a second by Bevins to approve the consent calendar. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Bevins? Yes. T. Erickson? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Yes, that motion carries. It brings us to the next item on our agenda is presentations, and that is the camp pre annual update. And I believe that's call it user three. Um, just to check to see if everybody can hear me. We can hear you. Excellent. I'm hoping that somewhere in your packet of information, you received a hard copy of my briefing for tonight. And um, as I go through it, I will be referring to what page I'm on. So I'm excited to come and meet with the, the council members and see the mayor again, all virtually over the phone. Hopefully someday we can all meet again and socialize. But I'm truly excited to come and, and have a chance to um, brief your um, city council. Obviously, nor normally we try to do this in person in the March, April timeframe. Um, COVID has kind of slowed us down a little bit as well. So I'm joining you now in July. And so part, part of what I'll brief you has occurred, but um, the good news is we continue to strive on and do a good job. So on slide two, um, it shows my Camp Ripley mission, which you know I, I normally try to explain to people that it's really threefold. Um, my job is to provide the best facilities I can to support our um, nation's warriors as they prepare for our nation's worst day, as well as provide the best um, facilities possible as our soldiers and our state agency and local governments prepare for the state's worst day. And so 
Um, you know, we all know that we had a lot of National Guard soldiers down in Minneapolis here a month or so ago, and we're pretty proud of the fact that they were so well prepared to, to um, react and, and help protect the Minneapolis area um, once called. Um, the third leg of my stool of my mission statement is to be the best neighbor I can be. And um, truly that's the heart of why I'm coming to talk to you tonight is part of that public information. And I really want to enlist your help in helping um, keep your, um, your constituents informed based on what you learned tonight, hopefully, on how important Camp Ripley is to the Bruce community. Buxton. Has joined slide, the meeting. Slide three is a picture of um, my current um, boss. That's Major General John Jensen. If you saw some news conferences during the riots that we had, you saw a lot of how what a phenomenal leader he is. Um, he's such a good leader that he's been nominated to go to Washington, D.C. and and become the, the commander of what we call the Army National Guard. Um, which means that he'll he'll run the headquarters that coordinates resources for all the 54 states and territories National Guard, um, both on the Army side. So that's a pretty prestigious position that he's been nominated for. And so we'll surely have a new picture on there with a new tag. Um, his assistant is CSM Brian Soper. He's, he's new from our briefing from last year to you. Um, he comes from the the Fargo-Moorhead area, and he, he spent a lot of time at the Army National Guard Bureau, so he comes with a lot of national connections, which helps us out a lot. Um, slide four brings us into some new leadership in our division headquarters as well. Um, Brigadier General Mike Wickman took over command of the 34th Infantry Division, and he's his assistant is CSM. Um, Michael Whitehead. Um, interesting note for CSM Whitehead is he's also the national president of the Disabled American Veterans. So at every level, we've got some connectivity both in the state and at the national level. Finally, on slide five, you'll see a picture of the Camp Ripley leadership team. I'm probably the most constant, the constant picture there. Um, I've been in place since the fall of 2017. I replaced the garrison commander this fall. Um, Colonel Brian Melton retired after he came back from his deployments to um, Lebanon, or to Jordan, I'm sorry. Um, he was replaced by Colonel Joshua Seimer. And um, we also um, replaced CSM Matt Erickson with CSM Marcus Erickson. So we didn't have to change much on the sign when we got a new CSM at Camp Ripley. But um, they both um, assist me in day-to-day -day operations and helping plan what we're doing at the installation. Slide um, six details our economic impact for 2019. You'll see it's fairly constant from other years. Um, overall, we were probably down a little bit in total um, FY19 um, dollars. Uh, a lot of that is tied to the, our ebb and flow of our construction projects on the installation. Uh, this last year, we took and receded the final projects of the $31 million that we received to repair the damage, left the immediate. tornado damage buildings. Um, but um, we still have a fairly constant level of income of, or um, of financial benefit to the community of around $300, $300 million a year. Out of that, there's about 180 full-time employees. And I want to say I saw the other day that about 96 of them, uh, 96 of that 780 full-time employees are residents of Brainerd. So if you go to slide eight, um, details a little bit of how COVID has affected our installation as well. We spent a lot of time um, training our soldiers on how to do what we call distributed guard drills. Um, specifically, they stayed at home and worked for the worked in their guard job at home doing a lot of online training as well as other things that they could do um, while at their home or record. We've also obviously had to modify how we house people on the installation. So it's cut my overall capacity about in half of our barracks. Um, and then we've instituted a pretty um, intensive um, cleaning program between units when they come and draw our barracks. Interesting fact with the COVID-19 piece right now is 
We are in the middle of testing about 4,000 Minnesotans that are part of the first of the first of the 34th Armor Brigade. Those kids are getting ready to go to the National Training Center, and before they can they can fly on the charter aircraft to Fort Irwin, California, for their three weeks of training. Um, they come here first and receive a COVID test from a DA, Department of Army mobile testing lab. And within three hours to um, or to ten hours, we can have results back from that, and um, it gives us a chance to identify positive COVID tested soldiers that are not showing any symptoms and isolate them from the rest of the formation. And currently, I have 39 soldiers that we've that have tested positive that are in our isolation support facility from that action. Slide nine talks about some of the construction that we continue to do on Camp Ripley. Um, two pictures on the right show the two buildings that we took final hand receipt to from the 2016 tornado that did some urban renewal on my installation. Um, we were lucky to get $31 million to replace five buildings and we took hand receipt of the final two buildings in 2019. Um, the picture in the upper left is of the is a good picture of the, what we're calling the longhouses. Um, I'm using those 100 packed buildings are being used as a replacement for the 10 huts that populate our, our summer housing area. And we'll, the best part of that is we're turning summer housing area into year round housing area. And that's indicative of how your National Guard has to train year round right now. Our first Armored Brigade combat team was here in January and February doing gunnery with their tanks. And um, that's gonna become the new norm for them as they continue to have to go out of the state for summer exercises. Slide 10 shows some other projects that we've worked on over the last year that have come, that are finished. The upper left is my fire department's new building that houses about 15 shiny red fire trucks. Um, we're pretty excited about our fire department and, and the capability it's brought to the community. Um, they have been assigned an area along 371 from the Morrison County Sheriff so that they can actually provide some fire coverage to the residents up by Fort Ripley um, who didn't have any fire departments within uh, a good insurance range before. Um, over the last year, we've had about 225 off-post calls with that fire department. The majority of them were for the Gold Cross Ambulance station there that they occupy and, and run ambulance calls on, but we have had a few rescue calls. Um, most recently, last month, they participated in extracting the state patrolman that was in the accident up by Fort Ripley. And um, so pretty great story of our ability through the joint powers agreement that's signed between Morrison County entities and Camp Ripley to provide some capability off the installation. Below that in the lower left picture is a picture of some of the backup generators that we're putting at all our substations. When we finish this project, we'll have backup generators at all our substations. And this next year, we intend to buy the computer controls software that will be the last piece needed to allow us to become an island and um, go off the grid and provide our own power in an emergency. And so um, that those generators complemented with our 86 acre solar field will give us the capability of, of producing enough electricity to run the installation if we have to go off the grid. And the computer SCADA software allows us to balance that load. And so that's probably the last most important piece. Finally, in the lower right there, um, our, our post exchange, the, the Army Air Force exchange, um, did a complete remodel of the interior of the exchange as well. So really nice facility for our soldiers to get the necessities they need while they're here on the installation. Slide 11 talks about some of our scheduled training. Obviously, June has passed. Um, if you were around in June, you saw a lot of aviation flights. Um, we um, have had a lot of C-130 traffic over the last month here in June, and um, that's because of all, you know, our, our pilots weren't able to train in March and April as well. So they're trying to make up that time. So which was a normal flight pattern of maybe three nights a week that I'd see 130s buzzing my house and flying around the installation. Um, we currently are spending about five days a week doing that. 
here in July, um, our biggest piece in July is we are in the, we or at the end of June we moved out 10 trains worth of equipment. So our rail line saw a lot of activity again as all that equipment went out to the National Training Center. Um, we'll kind of get quiet here once they once the brigade leaves. Uh, but um, then we roll into August where we'll have some artillery firing for the one of the 151 field artillery. And then our brigade returns the end of August and in September they'll leap right into a requalification phase as they prepare to deploy in January to Kuwait. And so they got to spend most of September, October, and November qualifying with their tanks and Bradley. So we'll continue to produce, produce noise throughout the fall associated with that. And then finally in October, you can see the, the significant amount of civilian training that, that we had planned. Um, our snowplow um, trainer training that normally occurs in September and October has been canceled for the year due to COVID, but we hope that the DOT comes back and more importantly, we hope for a mild winter so that the training they missed isn't missed out on our highways. Um, Slide 12 talks a little bit about our Air Force and Guard Reserve units. As I talked before, we've got two Air Force um, C-130 wings stationed here in Minnesota. They're both stationed in the in the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. One is an Air Force Reserve and one is an Air National Guard wing. Both those wings use Camp Ripley extensively as their training ground for flights. And so when they're swirling around my base, they're um, practicing touch and goes on my runway, as well as um, touch and goes on our 3,000 foot expeditionary runway, which is a big long gravel road next to our main road runway. Um, that's important because we have one of the only ones that's certified in the inventory. And um, so a lot of C-130 wings that are going to support our troops in Afghanistan continue to come to Camp Ripley and practice landing on that expeditionary runway. Finally, they spend also some time dropping pallets up in the northwest corner of our installation, and those pallets are GPS-guided parachute dropped um, supply pallets that they're practicing dropping on a, a specific point on the ground, which is pretty amazing technology if you think about it. Slide 13 talks about some of my full-time partners that continue to live on the installation. Um, the DNR and the State Patrol both continue to do their academies here. The State Patrol Academy started in January and they finished early in April by um, running their cadets over all the weekends. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they were glad to have that extra manpower when the riots in Minneapolis and St. Paul were occurring here this last month. The DNR is in the middle of doing their their Conservation Officer Academy right now. There's 15 um, students in that academy and they'll graduate here in August from that. And then finally, HSEM and MnDOT have a presence here. HSEM is obviously training your emergency managers in their emergency management training center, but also um, we'll use that center as we start to ramp up potentially for um, some line three activities as well. Line, our slide 14 kind of talks about some of the community outreach that we do, and we're very excited about our Camp Ripley open house. We had a very successful open house this last year in September. Um, we dedicated the program to celebrating the Air Force's contribution to the Minnesota and Minnesota military. Um, that was coupled with the, the reveal of the Final painting by the by the artist Charles Capster at the Veterans Cemetery. His painting was a tribute to the Air Force, so it's all neatly tied together, and we were able to celebrate both those events together. One of the other more important things that um, we started this year that I think is is um, really cool is we um, had a um, planning for the future event with our tribes of the Ojibwe um, tribes. So we brought students from the three Ojibwe high schools here to Camp Ripley and we had spent a day of cultural exchange where they taught us about their their Ojibwe culture. Um, we planted some native grasses together. We had an opportunity to eat together and um, it also had an opportunity for the recruiters to have a station there to talk to those kids as well. Um, throughout the year we have all sorts of other events. Obviously the spring with COVID we've We've um, had a huge impact on my um, disabled American veteran 
um, hunts, um, both my turkey hunt this spring as well as my trolling for the troops event were um, postponed to different dates. So we're hoping we get a hand on the COVID so we can continue to give those great veterans a chance to have some outdoor recreation as well. Slide 15 talks about Camp Ripley's environmental program, which as I've told you before is world renowned. I know it's world renowned because we continue to win awards at the Department of Defense level, which means that um, they are competing against the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the active duty Army, and all those installations that support those services across your nation. And once again, this year, our um, Camp Ripley team won the DOD Natural Resources Conservation Award. And so that's just a phenomenal statement of the quality of work we have here, but also probably a great statement of what an awesome um, environment Camp Ripley is to do um, conservation work um, with its three different, you know, zones from the prairies to the deciduous trees to the conifers. Gives us a lot of train, a lot of flat plants and flora that we can actually study and try to take care of and prove to the world that soldiers can train and shoot large howitzers and things right next to them without it really bothering them. Slide um, 16 goes in some detail of the environmental oversight that we have. Um, you know, having that award-winning program is important to me because it gives me the assurance that um, we are meeting all the requirements with all the different federal and state statutes and, and, um, and environmental checks that we have to follow. And so 16 kind of outlines all the different environmental agencies that come and make sure that we're um, protecting our natural resources and um, in all the different regulations that we have to follow. And so pretty, pretty good level of assurance from my point of view that we are such an award-winning installation because um, we're really preserving it for the future. Um, the next slide talks about our environmental partnerships and obviously we couldn't have all the work that we do without great environmental partnerships. And um, part of that is you know, between Bowser, the, water, the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, the Nature's Conservatory, they're really two big pieces that are involved with our execution of the Army Compatible Use Buffer Program and the Sentinel Landscape that's associated with it. As well as, uh, I love to highlight the fact that, you know, Central Lakes College in Brainerd and St. Cloud State University have strong internship programs here. So right now I can go out in the afternoon and watch interns um, learning about how to, you know, become great environmentalists um, from my great environmental team. Um, the other day I talked to one poor kid that was out there sorting traps for, for moles and obviously he was going to trap a bunch of moles for some kind of study. And um, just an example of some of the work they do. And so slide 18 talks about some of our prescribed burns that we had. Once again, this spring we burned almost 15,000 acres of Camp Ripley. Camp Ripley's 53,000 acres total. And on average, we burn about 15,000 acres. So a little over um, probably six, or one-fifth of the base gets burned every year. The majority of that burning is for what we call preventive fires or prescribed burns. Um, that's, that's so that we can burn off all the flammable grasses in the terrain where we're going to normally catch fires from some of the munitions we fire. Um, we also do some burns, and if you look on your map, all the stuff in orange are prescribed burns that are, that are, um, that are what we call um, hazard reduction burns are the burns that we do to keep the, the, you know, the chance of wildland fire low on the installation. The stuff in brown, though, are what we call mission enhancement burns, and that's areas that we're trying to change the vegetation to make it more suitable for the training that, want, that we want our soldiers to do in that area. So um, two different types of prescribed burns, and uh, this year you probably didn't really know that it was going on too much. We had one of the best springs you could have for um, prescribed fires, and um, without anybody training here in March and April, uh, they were really able to get after it quickly and get it done. And so um, a great spring for that and very successful for us. 
Finally, slide 19 talks about our ACUP and the landscape program. Um, you know, and to date, we've pumped about um, $42 million of federal funds into buying lifetime easements of properties around Camp Ripley. And so all the areas in green on the map are in that program or there is a standing lifetime easement on the property to keep it in the current state that it's in or that land in green is in already in some kind of compatible use. We're very excited in the fact that we just recently were able to buy the largest chunk of potlatch land that's been a part of that. Um, the potlatch um, logging company wanted to sell some land along Sullivan, um, Lake Sullivan in Sullivan Township and uh, we were able to work with the Sullivan Township and um, a couple other agencies to be able to purchase that land and now it'll be owned by the township and become green space in their township. And then ladies and gentlemen, finally the last slide is just a picture of my great team that are here to um, make sure that the installation runs well and that our customers get their needs served and um, everybody can meet their training needs. And so um, I truly wish I could look at you in the eye and, um, and see what all that as explained piqued your interest as I was going through it. But I'll open myself up for any kind of questions you have right now and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you, Commander. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Jean? President? Yep. Um, sir, no, I just read an article about a conservation um, property that Baxter had bought. Is that the same one with Lake Sylvan? It is. Yes, oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. So that doesn't hurt ha hamper you guys at all. In fact, it's a benefit for you then, huh? Uh, it's a great benefit for us. So oh. actually, we were heavily involved in getting that transaction done. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, okay. Thanks for the update, Commander, and I hope we'll see you in person next year. Yep. Hopefully, we'll see you next spring. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to the next item on the agenda, which is seven council committee reports. All crews. Safety, safety and public works committee, Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have five items on the agenda this evening. Item one is the event street closure application by the Early Childhood Family Education in the city of Brainerd for the second consecutive year to hold a truck, touch a truck event in downtown uh, as part of ISD, ISD 181's homecoming weekend. The event will be held Saturday, October 3rd from 10 a.m. until noon. Uh, they're requesting at Laurel Street between South 6 and South 8, as well as South 7th and Front and Maple Alley be closed from 7.30 in the morning to 1 p.m. The motion is to approve the special event application for the Brainerd ECFE and the City of Brainerd Touch a Truck event, providing all of the state governor's mandates for COVID can be met. And I so move. Lambert, second. We have a motion by Bevins, a second by Lambert. Any discussion? The motion. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Evans. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. That motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number two is also an event street closure application. In your packet is packet. It is listed as three separate or three two events, three dates the at the request of the applicant the date of july 25th that concert has been removed from consideration at this time so the motion is to accept staff's recommendation approve the application under the conditions that request for traffic control be made one week prior to the event and that the applicant coordinate police staffing with deputy police chief bestial for the event on the days of 9-11 and 9-12, and that a plan for social distancing, wearing masks, 
and controlling the event to be under the 250 people submitted by the police prior to the event and that any water and power needs with BPU be coordinated as well as meeting all the governor's requirements for COVID-19 on the days of the event and I so move. Lambert second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? This is Lambert. Jan. I have in the past two years, I have received calls uh, regarding the music um, being loud at late hours. I am wondering, would there be possible that we could have a um, uh, condition that the music to be turned down from 1030 to midnight um, for for this event? You know, I, I think we could put any condition we want on it. One problem we're coming from right now is we don't know how many decibels the noise was last year. So we don't know what down is. They could crank it up to 11 and then move it down to 10 and they did move the volume down, but it's still too loud. So I think we should figure out some type of decibel level that is appropriate for, for street dances at night in the city. Oh, that, that would be be helpful, I think, for the people that had called in, especially twice in, a, you know, two years in a row. So. Mm -hmm. And this way, just to show that they're being heard, too, I think it's important for, for the public to know that we have discussed it. Right. So I think we should definitely discuss it with the JCs and have them work with their sound person to make sure it is lower than it was in past years as, as the night drags on. Mm-hmm. I, and Kelly, I'm glad you clarified the dates. I was kind of confused when they were, we were approving the July 25th and September 11th and September 12th. And as a JC, I just didn't want to do that much work. So I'm glad we got rid of the July 25th event because we did cancel that and, and changed it to hold it in September, hopefully. Is there any other discussion? Mr. Mr. Chair, do do we need a motion to for me to ask for the deci the decimal um, to be reviewed by JCs? Do we need to add that to the motion, or can we just um, just go with what we I mean, have? If, uh, yeah, if you if you want to move to amend the motion, I you you have that right. Is it? Is it needed? I mean, I will, I, if it's needed, I sure will do that if it's okay with the motioner. It is. Okay. I would like to amend the um, motion to include that the JCs evaluate the decimal readings um, for the music of the Street Fest, especially from the hours from 1030 to midnight. Okay, so we are adding an amendment. Let's, any discussion on that amendment? We'll vote uh, motion. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. So the motion is amended to request to add that we request the JCs to monitor the decibels and keep it lower. At from 1030 on. Is there any discussion on the motion as a whole? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. That motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number three is improvements 13 21, 19 09, 19 16, 19 20, and 19 21. These are all our Northeast Brainerd reconstruction process, uh, projects. The, it, this is change order number one. Uh, the motion is to accept staff's recommendation, approve the attached change order, and subject the approval of the Personal and Finance Committee payment application under the Payments to Contractor section of their agenda for refer reference projects and ISO mode. We have a motion by Bevins and a second by Wayne Erickson. 
It was muted, but I saw it. it was a... <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair? Kelly. Just just a quick explanation for those people who don't have the packet in front of them. These are these are two step change orders. Uh, one is for some additional uh, keeping clean potable water to people while the construction project is underway. And the other is we had some utilities, uh, some storm sewer utilities that had to be moved to go under some existing utilities that were unexpected. And so it's just what the two of them are. A total of about $5,500. Okay, any other discussion or any questions? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item four is our citywide storm sewer hydraulic and hydrologic study proposal. The motion is to accept staff's authorization to enter into a professional services agreement with HR Green for the study of the cost not to exceed the budgeted amount of $70,000, uh, which comes out of the storm sewer fund 238 and I so move. Lambert second. Motion by Bevin, second by Lambert. Any discussion? So I have a question. Is this our kind of long-term plan for our stormwater that we authorize in the budget for this year? Is I this can answer that, Mr. President, if you would like. Please. Um, yes. Yeah, so we authorized uh, some money from uh, last year for our stormwater retrofit analysis, and that was partially funded by the Soil and Water Conservation District and the Mississippi Headwaters Board. This one um, doesn't really have to deal with green infrastructure. It really has to deal with um, where we see localized flooding during large storm events and what the best areas to upsize pipes in the future um, when we're doing street projects. So yeah, you can consider it kind of a long-term um, plan of where pipes or our main uh, storm sewer pipes should be upsized in the future and um, kind of informs us on where the potential problems could be um, with more uh, severe storm events. Excellent, thank you. Any other discussion? Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. That motion carries. Before we go back to the next item, I believe Alderman Pritchett has a constituent who wants to talk to the garbage receptacles discussion. Kelly, do you want to hear from the, the constituent or do you want to get your motion on the table? I'm indifferent, but I want to hear from the constituent tonight. Yeah, well, Mr. Chair, the constituent did not show up. So if you're interested in hearing from him, I would suggest you do so now. Jennifer? Mr. Chair, so I did call uh, the constituent prior to the meeting. Um, he was not going to join the council meeting. I did say that I would follow up with him. Um, I asked if there was anything that he wanted me to share with the council. And he just said that he was very concerned about garbage cans um, being left out, of flies and vermin maybe attracted to those receptacles, and that he just wanted to make sure that it was brought to the attention of the city council. And so We'll make sure that I follow up with him tomorrow after this. Okay, thank you, Jennifer Kelly. Back thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the issue was just outlined uh, very well by um, Jennifer Bergman. We have no motion at this time because the issue, the understanding of the issue is quite clear. Leaving the garbage receptacles out on the street, it affects all kinds of health, safety, welfare, as well as making it a challenge to um, uh, to plow and, and other things. They end up in the street uh, more often than not. Uh, the issue is not 
is not just regulating the receptacles though. You can see Community Development Ch Director Chansky has written a very simple uh, amendment to our ordinances. The problem becomes enforcement. And this has been an issue that has been before us in the past. We have uh, four or five or more different private garbage haulers, all of them on different schedules. So who's supposed to be out there on what days, how long is the 24 hour window and who's gonna enforce them and what is that enforcement? Is it gonna be fining? Is it gonna be picking up the receptacles? So the, we had a, new, a number of questions that we asked David Chansky to answer, uh, one of which he answered tonight, and that's, is there other communities that have this regulation? Yes, there is, but nothing on how they enforce it, okay? The other issue is, goes back to uh, uh, also enforcement and with all the number of garbage carriers, wouldn't it be simpler to also address the issue of um, regulating garbage pickup as we have looked at in the past? Uh, yes, it would. It would make more sense if Northeast had one carrier, North, Southwest, et cetera, et cetera, what we've discussed in the past. Maybe there's another way to do that. So in two weeks, we expect to come back with answers to these questions. We also expect to bring our garbage haulers in in, a, in a, the next meeting right after that, and then hopefully can have an answer to the much more complex question of how can we do this. Um, this has been an issue, not just of recent memory, but it's been on for uh, literally decades. So hopefully we can bring this to a closure within the next two meetings, Mr. Chair. But right now we have no meeting on it or no motion on it. All right, thank you, Kelly. Any other comments on this, or do we all, we all like that timeline? Timeline looks good. End of report, Kelly? Yes, sir. Thank you. That moves us to B, Personnel and Finance, Alderman Pritchett. All right, we have eight items on the agenda. Item number one is a transfer of bills and the 2019 transfer of funds, and I so move. And I second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right. Item number two is the discussion of the Lakes Area Media Collaborative. Uh, a little bit of background on this. Um, you know, what happens is we get the cable franchise fees, which, you know, we have been giving to the Lakes Area Collaborative, uh, Media Collaborative, it's about $66,000 a year. The issue is, um, you know, they had agreed to basically purchase and install the video equipment. City Hall right now would be ready for us to have in-person meetings, except for we have no way to stream it um, to, our, to, our, to the public. So. Uh, there was a hard deadline set for July 7th. They did not meet the deadline. There's another deadline set for the 20th. And it's a little bit bigger than that. Um, Sean uh, uh, Strong and IT has been in discussions since October trying to get this done. Um, Digital Horizons is supposed to do the installation, but they did not have the equipment. Um, basically, where it is right now, they have apparently have purchased two of the cameras uh, and ordered another way past the deadline one of the other kind of mitigating factors is right now, Charter doesn't have a channel for us. Um, they want a lot of local programming before they did that. And so even if they did uh, reinstate a channel or restart a channel, um, the costs might be astronomical. So with that kind of as the background, um, the motion coming out of the committee was to direct staff to look for an agreement with Lakes Area Collaborative because we've heard talk of agreement, but we've never seen this agreement. All right, and then the other thing is staff will present a recommendation to the council at our next regular meeting and that that means if the lakes. Um, lakes area media collaborative comes in and starts installing the equipment on the 20th and everything looks good, then we can kind of still revisit where we go from there. And if they don't, then we can look at taking a, a different venue if we wish and I so move. 
Second, Erickson. We have a motion by Pritchett, a second by Erickson. So I, I have a question. We're setting these deadlines, and if they don't meet them, are we still going to invest our money to get the cameras up, Dave? Well, right now we we kind of a, the way I understand it, we agreed upon those deadlines. We have not paid um, those fees for, uh, for for 2020, so it's not we won't be losing money in that aspect. And that was one of our concerns too. If we'd already paid the money for the camera cameras out of it, and that's also why we're looking for the agreement to see where we are kind of legally. Yeah, and I think that's the right first step. Absolutely, is to get the agreement. And then one other question. With the losing the charter channel, channel 181, should we be directing staff to look into the exact steps that are required to reinstitute that? So as we're making a decision on July 20 or August 5th or whatever, we decide whether it's even feasible for us to continue to do that. And, and I think that's kind of in it. Uh, uh, Sean, if you want to add anything to that, but yeah, they're kind of looking at, at that a little bit or have yeah. Sean? Um, yeah, the only thing I can say is, um, as far as the agreement goes, we've never seen it. We've looked for it. We've never seen a copy of it, so we don't know what it says. And the other part is, um, like, our charter got rid of the cable channel. They disconnected it or whatever. They said at least 180 days to get it back up and going. And they wanted, it made it sound like they wanted more content than just a couple hours of city council meetings to spin up a channel. And I don't know what the parameters of that is, how much content they would actually need or need to see in a way, but um, we, Cause I imagine we can know the process is to get it going again. I guess I don't know what the steps are, but. Yeah, if we could get those steps, just so we know, it's gonna be 180 days and we need 20 hours of programming or what it is, let's figure out what it is, what we need as we move forward, making those decisions. And then we could task the mayor with providing content because he does have some equipment. He's got the green screen. He could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, this yeah. is Lambert. Um, do we have to just go through charter? Can we go through some of the other like CGC or something? Or are we bound by charter? I don't we're know. We're not bound by charter, if I may. Um, we're not bound by charter, but they happen to be the very large percentage of the city of Brainerd coverage wise. <laughs> I would just guess at around yeah. percent or something. There's a little bit of CTC covered in the Brainerd area or in the city of Brainerd center limits, but not a lot. Okay. So I'm sure we could probably easily get CTC to stream our stuff, but it's going to be going to Baxter mm -hmm. County residents that have not many Brainerd folk are going to see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Perhaps, perhaps we could work with the county on content too, or they could start putting their meetings out there too. They're recording them. They have them. But just something to look forward to. We have a motion, and I think it's a good motion. Is there any other discussion on the motion? And none will vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. E. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right, item number two is the resignation of paid on call firefighter uh, cell. Uh, so this is a retirement. This gentleman served 16 years. He was actually the firefighter of the year in 2018. And the motion coming out of committee is to accept and forget the resignation of firefighter cell effective July 31st, 2020. And I so move. Second, Stunick. We have a motion and a second to accept with regret. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right. Item number four is the retirement of Officer Troy Schreifels. Um, again, Officer Schreifels has been served 24 years. Um, and as, as of right now, the police and fire civil service committee, they met on July 1st and certified the top three names, uh, and we'll be giving, there have been conditional job offers submitted that will come back to council after successful completion of the pre-employment screening. So the motion coming out is to accept with regret, uh, officer Schreifel's, uh, retirement effective August 16th. And I so move. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll say it's a big loss to not only the Brainerd Police Department, but to the Brainerd High School. Mm -hmm. Rifle's retiring. My daughter just graduated this year, and all of those kids there have nothing but respect for that man. And he's done a great job in the schools, and we're really going to miss him. Any other discussion? Mr. Chair, this is this is Robert. I just want to pass um, my uh, congratulations to uh, Troy, but I just want to ask the uh, chief. I hope you don't have to take too many headache medications for the life of another police officer. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Hans? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, motion carries Alderman Pritchett. All right, item number five is a request to use drug forfeiture funds uh, to purchase a Microsoft Surface com laptop computer for, for our lieutenant. Um, the, the price for that is $1,037. Uh, $1, uh, the current balance in the, front, uh, the drug forfeiture fund is $6,358.95. And the motion coming out of the committee is to approve this. Um, and I so move. And I second it, Stunick. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert? Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Bevins? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. T. Erickson? Yes. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right. Item number six is the resignation of Seth Greenwald Street Maintenance One. Uh, motion coming out of committee is to accept Seth Greenwald's resignation, um, last day being July 9th, 2020, and authorize staff to begin uh, uh, to the hiring process to backfill the position. And I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, just so everybody knows, he, he was offered a position in one of the local communities, um, so it, it seemed kind of an advantageous thing for him to accept that. So it's kind of closer to home, I guess. Well, good for him. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Bevins? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. T. Erickson? Yes. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right, item number seven is a memorandum, memorandum of agreement with LELS to extend the appeals uh, panel decision. A little bit of background when we started performance pay. Um, the process included a three member appeals panel with a lot of time to, to do the reviews is five days when we actually had some appeals in 2019. Uh, the mediator from the Bureau of Mediation Services recommended that we extend the period to a more reasonable time. Uh, and the city and the union agreed to extend it to six weeks. So the motion is to approve the memori memorandum of agreement as presented between the city of Brainerd and the law enforcement labor, labor services, um, which would be 65, Inc., 65, number 65 union, extending the time frame for the appeals panel to reach a binding decision after an annual performance evaluation presented from five days to six weeks, and I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Evans. Yes. yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right, eight and the final item is the recycling fund discussion. Um, recycling fund 227, which is revenue from the county uh, scores fund, uh, is used for, you know, for development waste and recycling and solid waste management, which includes the oil recycling facility kind of by the fire station. Uh, we have no score funds this year, and there's a shortfall of $1,078. So the question was how to uh, proceed with this. So, um, Basically, the motion coming out of committee was to direct 
staff to go into discussion with BPU to split the cost for the recycling fund um, with the money uh, coming to cover that cost coming from the storm sewer fund and I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? President. This is Jan again. Um, how was that normally funded? Is there a, 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 I'm sorry, I don't know, but how, how is it funded? Is there, um, do we put, when you use it, put a fund, you know, some money into it or if, what? <laughs> I've never had to use it, so I don't know. Yeah, Alder, Alderman Pritchett, if you can answer that, if not, Connie. For the public to use it, you can give a free, wing, free will offering, but you don't have to pay anything. And so they take oil filters, oil, anti -spring. And so this actually helps us a lot with things like water quality and water treatment. And normally it was paid for by that scores fund, but since 2015, we've had to pay some of that money. So, you know, what we're looking at, at talking to BPU, the people that we've talked with are on vacation right now, so uh, they should be able to come back to us and, and let us know whether BPU accepts that or not. And if they do, then, then we're covered. Dave, as I understand it, we get the scores fund, we transfer it, negotiate the contract with the oil company that actually takes the oil and filters above what we received from the county. Yeah, there was there were no funds from the scores funds this year. No. And the free will offerings aren't covering the whole thing. Connie? Going to provide clarification. The score fundings we receive from the counties go directly to the haulers. So what we're looking for is the free will offerings to pay for the recycling of the antifreeze and use oils and to pay for the dumpster container that is next to the facility. And we're falling short. Free will offerings fall short, so we need to figure out where to find this thousand dollars. Okay. Any other discussion? Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. End of report. Thank you. That brings us to eight unfinished business. A call for applicants. The mayor is looking for three people to serve on the cable TV advisory committee five people to serve on the Charter Commission, and one person to serve on the EDA. Applications can be found on our website or at City Hall. 8B, the mayor does have one recommendation for the Charter Commission, and that is Kevin Yeager. Looking for a motion to approve that recommendation. So I'm going with Evans. Evans, Jennifer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just uh, to clarify, it would be the term ending 2023. So he's taking the long term. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve Kevin Yang to the Charter Commission ending end of year 2023. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Bevins? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. T. Erickson? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. That brings us to 8C, City Hall Remodel, Front Stairwell, Exterior Work, Discussion, and Overall Project Update. Is this Paul? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Yep. <clears throat> So um, we're kind of bringing this to the council's attention, not only to give you all an update on the overall facilities projects, especially after the fire, but um, we really wanted to bring this forward as um, we as staff had have a discussion more recently about the exterior work and what the original plan was for, especially the front steps. Um, currently, uh, the front steps of City Hall in the bid out work call for a simple tuck point of the front steps. Um, we met on site with uh, Contegrity, WSN, um, the contractor, and really we came to the conclusion that we're all a little bit worried that it will not resolve some of the unevenness of the staircase. Um, we have some staining, some rust staining, delaminations uh, from the exist or the old railings that used to be there. Um, and the surface of the granite um, is quite slippery in the wintertime um, and just the overall aesthetics of the steps. And so 
what we did is we put together some recommendations at the time um, for changes in scope to the front steps. Um, and that was a at the time of this uh, agenda, but we do have that available to us at this meeting. Um, so really is what we want to talk about tonight is what the council's feel is for a couple of recommendations that I think Mike England will present. Uh, Connie, if you want to um, wait for Mike to kind of, uh, you know, uh, introduce the different options and put those up, I guess I will turn it over to Mike to kind of give the council a, a quick overview of what we're talking about. Take it away, Mike. He's not muted. Plan B, Paul. Well, oh, Kevin, are you on the line? I am. So Kevin is also here. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of take off. So the uh, like I said, the original options were to tuck point the stairs, which really you can see in this existing photo that um, a tuck point really isn't going to take care of a lot of the issues we're seeing here. And so a couple of the options that WSN drew up were one to place um, to remove all of the existing granite stairs, um, drill sono tubes or like a foundation system and some cross beams and then lay a concrete staircase and then cut the granite. Uh, to like a two inch slab to place on top. Um, that option right there, Connie, is the granite with concrete on top. So go to the other one I sent. Um, and then of course the other option would um, refinish the, the, the granite to um, be the main portion of the staircase and then put a concrete exposed aggregate covering over the top. So two separate options, it's basically where the granite is on the step. Um, this would allow us to pull all the steps off, redo the foundation and the so underlying soils. Um, we're about 99% sure there are the meeting. underneath those steps um, and also get a proper foundation under the steps. Um, it would also include a kind of a washing and repainting of the side rails that are a part of the original steps, uh, kind of the EFIS structure, um, redo the railings and making sure that the front of the building really um, kind of is the focal point when you walk into City Hall. You know, we've gone through so much, redo the interior of City Hall. We really wanted to make sure that the um, front steps or the entrance into City Hall is kind of the focal point and that it really outlines, you know, the city's care for its historic building. So um, I guess, Kevin, you kind of have the cost laid out and how it all relates to our contingency. Um, what the contractor has submitted so far um, to kind of give the council an idea of um, what option they would prefer, whether that's sticking with the current option of just tuck pointing or actually redoing it to more of a um, long term solution, such as what we're presenting here tonight. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, we received an email from Marauder Brothers this afternoon. Um, that uh, gives us a budget price for the work. And I want to emphasize that at this point, uh, it is a budgetary in nature because uh, we need to do some exploratory work as far as what exists under the existing stairs, uh, what structural modifications we would need to make uh, under those stairs, and then Obviously, we've got a couple of options to consider. Um, so I would anticipate that this would be kind of a, a stepped uh, establishment of the scope and price together. We would do some exploratory work under either scenario of removing the existing steps. Uh, so that has to be done. Uh, more than likely, the most advantageous thing for the city would be to do that on a time and material basis. Uh, then we can kind of firm up the scope of work after we do that. Uh, we will select an option and then we can fine tune the pricing accordingly. Um, the first option, um, which was to, let me see, the first one is to 
um, use the stone as the treads, uh, totals approximately $92,000. Uh, if we just use the stone as a riser and then pour concrete treads, uh, that would be increased by about ten thousand dollars to uh, just over one hundred one hundred two. So that's that is the pricing that we received. Um, as far as what that does to our budget, at the time of bid, we had a, an amount of eighteen thousand dollars. But before I go on, does anybody have any questions on what I've talked about so far? Uh, Kelly. Thank you. Hey, Kevin, is there going to be a middle railing put back or not? Uh, I believe that Mike has been working with the code officials and we are hoping that the answer to that is not. Okay. It's, it's problematic. We could put the middle railing up to near the top landing, but if we were to extend it as it calls for in the code past the top step, it's it makes it very difficult to get in and out of the doors because of the limited width of the top landing. Thank you. So it's, it's almost unusable if we were to put the rail in per the code. That ha that's code for you. I have one more, Mr. Chair. Kelly. I'm, I noticed, um, Kevin, that there's some discussion on the poured, the, the, the tread as being poured as being safer. And I heard Paul Sandy mention that as well. And having seen what those granite steps can be like when wet, is there truth to that? Maybe some of the obvious? Yeah. It, you have more so much more control over the surface with concrete uh, as far as the texture and what texture you want. Um, and also um, the longevity. Um, we could place these steps. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I think we could put even the widest ones we could probably pour without a joint. So we have a continuous slab of concrete without joints that over time would allow moisture to get in and the freeze thaw cycle would start working on it. So it's a much more durable surface as well as being a uh, safer underfoot. Thank you. Mr. President, Jan. Um, uh, for Kevin, the side rails, the railings on the side, now does that go all the way to the base of the stairs, or does it stop? It looks like it stops about the second one up. Is it, does it go all the way but down? Yes, it does go all the way down to the second one. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kevin, Gabe here, I have one question, just budgetary. We, we budgeted, you said about $18,000 in the project for this. Based on the work done by Contegrity and WSN in our long-term facilities study when you had the eighteen thousand dollar number was that not fully repairing the steps or what that was only tuck pointing or why why didn't you tell us three years ago that it was a hundred two thousand dollars uh yeah the scope of work at the time um because we didn't know how the bids were kind of come in and we wanted to be conservative um the $18,000 was to essentially to tuck point to seal back up the stairs so that there wouldn't be further deterioration. I would like to continue uh, the thought that I had started there before I asked for questions. I have it away. Take it away. You're good. The um, combined exterior masonry renovations and the tuck pointing of the stairs. If you look at those two line items combined on our last estimate before it went out for bids, when the bids came in, we were $36,000 under the estimate with the bids. So, and that $36,000 uh, uh, under 
the estimate went into the contingency. So we are starting, when you look at the two, look at all the work combined that Barado Brothers is contracted to do, we started in a position of negative 36,000 or positive, depending on how you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. 36,000 to the good. Um, so uh, that's just, it kind of offsets where we're at now. Um, and uh, the, the contingency that I referred to in the current budget spreadsheet that was submitted with our last bill, um, the contingency amount currently stands at one hundred and eighty four thousand and twenty three dollars. OK, so we're still within the contingency scope if we if we do change the stairs project. Well, within, yes, we would, okay. we would have approximately depending on the option we'd have. Oh, around ninety thousand dollars left. OK, well, then I, I think it's a no brainer to do the, the best job we can on the stairs being that really Mr. President. This project started by us saying we need to fix the stairs in the HVAC, so we should at least get those two done right. Paul? Yeah, I think Mike might be able to speak now, and I don't know if he's... Mike, can you hear us now, or can you talk? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear yep. you. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I, I um, yeah, my computer audio isn't working, but uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, to go back to your question, uh, the amount of heaving that has occurred with these steps um, is of course due to freestyle cycles and so there has been significant shifting um, and so what we've identified in our plan is to uh, provide you with a solution that we feel will address the issue and it'll be a, a long-term solution now with it with saying that we have very little information that identifies what the foundation will is currently underneath of those slabs of granite. Um, the only drawing we have indicates that there's maybe maybe some foundation that runs uh, north south in the in the middle. But what we're thinking is that we need to um, actually bring in some engineered fill and pour additional sonotube tube footings that could um, ensure that all of the Granite steps will be uh, properly supported. The other thing that we feel is very important to consider is the integration of concrete, as Kevin mentioned. But that could be the solid foundation portion, maybe the treads, the horizontal surface, and the granite could be incorporated to uh, uh, bring that historical material in there. And so we just we're taking a look at it a couple of different ways, but. From three to four years ago when we took a look at this in November of 2018 or whatever it was, it does seem and it does appear that there have been uh, more freeze-thaw cycles that have caused additional shifting. And so it is in excess of just uh, simply re-tuck pointing these and, and putting in different materials. So, um, so that's where we're at with it. And, and we also feel like if we can take the granite steps off a few of them and get a better idea of what's there, that's really gonna help us as well to determine the final scope of work. And um, fortunately, you know, we're working with Brado and, and uh, you know, they've agreed to do this so that we could put together a more definitive scope for everyone to uh, see that would be the right solution. Well, all right. Are you guys looking for direction from the council tonight on what we want the finished product to look like? Or are you just wondering for permission to dig in and see what we have for a foundation? Mr. Johnson, this is Mike Anglin again. I, I think it would be nice from an aesthetic standpoint as well as the historical uh, standpoint, uh, what your preference would be. You know, what we'd like to do is propose something that works with the uh, winter months and, and trying to maintain a, the front steps. And so obviously incorporating a, a concrete material would be, it, it would perform better, it would be safer. Uh, so there's different ways we can do that to capture the aesthetics, make it aesthetically pleasing, but then also functional and last longer for you. 
So we just felt it was appropriate to produce these two 3Ds to give you those images and see what your initial thoughts were. Okay, thanks, Mike. So yeah, talking out to the council if anybody has any more questions of Mike or Kevin, or if there's a motion, Kelly. I have a motion when you're ready. Go ahead. I move to authorize Contegrity and um, and uh, and our and Mike to go ahead and remove the steps to, and and uh, with the understanding of using granite risers and concrete steps and preserve the original quality to the greatest ability and come back with a more exact price within two weeks. I second it, Lambert. So we have a motion and a second. Kelly, I think that's a good motion. I agree with it. And I want to give, you know, Kevin and Mike and their teams credit for finding creative ways to still use our classic granite on the steps. And I, I think that's really good. Any other discussion to the motion? John, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. T. Erickson? Yes. Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Anything else from Kevin or Mike or Paul? Well, yeah, uh, Paul, I don't know if you have anything, but uh, if you don't, I would just give a brief uh, review of where we're at on the remainder of the project. Yeah, that's fine. I think that's a good thing to do, Kevin. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, today, uh, I'll start with the exterior. Um, we are preparing to start work on the masonry uh, cleaning and repair of the exterior. Uh, they've done a sample cleaning. Um, I think they want to do a little another one to see uh, there's an option to use a chemical cleaner, and uh, I think they're going to do that to uh, do another sample. But anyway, that work is teed up, and I would anticipate that it would start uh, sometime next week. Um, as, as soon as we approve, uh, uh, Mike and the design team approves the mock-up of the cleaning and repair. Um, the roof work is completed as of today, I believe um, they were putting on the metal coping on the perimeter uh, today. And uh, that will wrap up the roof work. Um, the uh, mechanical system, the boiler uh, equipment is almost complete. They're putting in the vent piping now. Uh, they're doing some more work on the controls for the air handler in the mechanical penthouse. And uh, once that work is done, that equipment will be started up. The system will be charged. And we anticipate that within the next uh, two weeks, that work will be done. Um, and that just leaves the steps in the outside to be completed. Uh, we're not really sure of the duration yet. Um, I'm still waiting on that schedule from the exterior people, but I would anticipate that it would be three or four weeks once they get started. Hey, Kevin, yeah. this is Mike Gagan. Um, I'd just like to add on to that. We did have our um, uh, pre-meeting on site, as you, as you mentioned, Kevin, there is sampling in terms of washing the building and matching the existing brick mortar as well as the um, other elements. And so the process, I just want the uh, city council and everyone to be aware, uh, we do uh, expect uh, matching materials and uh, this building is very historic and it, it's uh, uh, very sentimental to a lot of folks here in, in the city of Brainerd. And so I just want you all to know that that, that is definitely part of the process. Uh, we are respectful to the historic nature of this building. and so. Similar to the steps, we're certainly approaching the exterior work in a very similar way. Uh, Kevin had mentioned using a uh, certain chemical product. Um, we have to be very careful with the types of products that we use and approve. And so we did discuss the right product to use 
so that it's not uh, damaging to the brick, to the mortar. Um, it's, it's specifically made to be uh, uh, so that it's not as destructive with historic materials. So it's just in those areas where there's a lot of dirt and grime over a lot of years. But for you as a city council and, and speaking with your constituents, there is a lot of uh, special care that needs to be taken with historic preservation and with the exterior work that we're doing. So I just wanted you to be aware of conversations that uh, Kevin, Paul, and myself have had with Verado and, and their contractors. And it's been, it's been great. So everybody is definitely on the same page with these expectations. So thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, I would just kind of like to wrap up by saying that uh, the carpet in the council chambers went in on Friday. Uh, the ceiling tile in the third floor offices that were damaged by uh, fire went in uh, late last week. Uh, the cleaning of that space took place uh, last Thursday. And so the building uh, from an occupancy standpoint is pretty much ready to go. Well, that's good news. We just need to get some camera equipment. Yep. So, I don't know, Paul, any other uh, concerns, questions, or comments on the uh, construction progress? No, I think uh, you pretty much covered everything, Mike and Kevin. And I just want to give my hats off to you two for helping us through this process. It's been a challenge, especially after the fire, but uh, we've all uh, work together to uh, get the contractors back on site to get city staff back to where we finally moved back into third floor partially today. And uh, by the end of the week, we should all kind of be where we're going to be long term. So it's worked out pretty well. Hey, that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Once again, good job on everything so far and uh, look forward to moving back in. Next up is new business. 9A is the update on the dangerous dog, Mike. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh, is this working? This is. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so on the 29th, when you guys, the 14 days when you guys wanted me to follow up, I did. And I sent an update to the city administrator Bergman. Did you guys get a copy of that? Yes. Okay, so there's been a, a little bit of a change since since then. Um, they had four requirements. The insurance was the one that they were not in compliance with, and they they did get an insurance policy. However, in reading over it right away, there it has are, left the meeting. This, is, this isn't the correct type of insurance, and I was able to speak with the actual um, insurance agent who wrote this policy today. And he told me, actually, when he found out what they needed, he wouldn't be able to insure this dog. Um, they, their company, which I'd never heard of, it's called Amelia Underwriters out of Florida. Um, they don't insure any dangerous dogs that have had, ever had more than one encounter or incident. And the kind of insurance they offer is only valid, like, uh, this is only valid on their property. If the dog gets away, or if they're negligent it's under or over the fence and gets away, there's an exclusion in here for that. So they wouldn't cover it. basically anything we need them to cover. They're not covering. Uh, so as of today, uh, which is seven days past the 14 days, uh, they are still not compliant with the insurance requirement. But they have a proper enclosure. <laughs> proper enclosure. Um, the dogs are licensed. The dog is licensed. Uh, they got, uh, they recently got that dog vaccinated for rabies. So as of today, it is vaccinated for rabies. They don't have the insurance requirement. And um, this, this, this company told me this evening that he wouldn't be able to insure them. He wouldn't be able to insure the dog. Okay, thanks, Mike. I guess that goes to the council now. We set forth four requirements, and three of the four have been met. What do we want to do about the unmet insurance part? Kelly? President?
Who's up? Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is it possible to have Mike go pick the dog up and take it out to Hart with a 10 day limitation that they provide the insurance and pay for the storage or we terminate the dog? Mike. Uh, right in the ordinance and state law, Kelly, Kelly's really close to what is required. Um, uh -huh. If they're not a compliant, we must seize the dog, hold it at their expense for up to 14 days. And that's right in our ordinance and state law. And after the 14 days, if they hadn't um, become compliant, then the city would, you know, we would euthanize the dog. Okay, Jan. Um, Mr. President, I guess maybe it's a, a question for whoever. Is it difficult? Is there any insurances that cover dangerous dogs? I, I, I guess, does Mike know or do you know? Um, I don't know, Mike, difficult? is there an insurance company that does? Yes, there is. It's extremely expensive, but there, there are companies. Um, I think the cost is part of what's prohibiting them here and, and they did some crowdfunding or whatever and we're able to raise some money to help help cover this um we had another issue last year and they had some quotes uh which were proper quotes but they simply couldn't the, this other family couldn't afford it and um so they just turned the dog over to us so there are companies that do offer this type of insurance it's it's extremely risky and they charge accordingly okay any other council questions? Kelly? I have a motion when you're ready. Uh, looks like we're ready. I move that we follow the ordinance as outlined by Mike O'Brien. Uh, that's my motion. We have a motion to follow the ordinance in state law. Is there a second? Second. Got a second from Tad Erickson. Kelly, speak to the motion. Mr. Chair, I think if we don't if we don't do it, then again we got garbage receptacles rolling down the street. You either gotta stand behind your ordinances or not. Now I'd like to think that maybe rather than euthanize the dog at the end of 14 days, maybe Hart could put it up for adoption. But our point is I think we have to pick the dog up. To give them the 14 days to comply. I know it's expensive. It would have been way cheaper to take care of the dog in the first place. It also <laughs> turns out they lied about the rabies. And that sort of, I mean, you know what? It, it just isn't, it isn't right to everybody else who does the right thing, who takes care of their dog, who licenses their dog, who gets rabies shots, who makes sure that their dog is under control at all times. Kelly, thank you. Dave Pritchett, you had something? Uh, I'm going to vote against this, but the only reason I'm voting against this is because I voted against it being a, designated as a dangerous dog in the first place. So if you believe it's a dangerous dog, I believe that we have to follow the ordinance, but I disagreed with that vote. I, I'm just explaining my vote. Okay. Any other discussion? Here, no, Mr. Mr. President. Dan. Didn't our motion address that there will be no um, uh, putting the dog down? No, I, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't say with certainty, but I think the motion was to follow the ordinance originally. And I think that's why Dave Pritchett voted against it, because he does not want to see this dog put down. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, Alderwoman Lambert, are you asking about the motion that was made on the June 15th? Yes. The meeting that, the, yes, the meeting that we had was the decision that we uh, made it as a uh, dangerous talk. Yes, yeah. yeah, so Mike, Mike and I both uh, re-listened to that portion of the city council meeting before sending this and not euthanizing the dog was in that initial motion. Um, just for clarification tonight, I think what I'm hearing is following the ordinance and state law. Okay. Okay, thank you. So that would be that would be euthanizing if they don't comply within 14 days of the dog being picked up. 
That is what I think I'm hearing in your motion, and I would love for clarification on that. Kelly, clarify that. Yes. Administrator Bergman is correct. We did include not euthanizing the dog and allowing the people 14 days to follow the recommendations of the council. At that point, they have not, and we have not euthanized the dog. Now they get 14 more days, but they don't get the dog in their possession. They have, we have to pick up the dog. We have to add the charges of storage for the dog. If they still don't comply, and remember, we can go get the dog and give it away, but to somebody outside the city of Brainerd, they did that to the other dog. But if they don't comply again, or if it turns out they've misled us a second time, I don't want to take the dog home. <coughs> Clarify, Jan. Um, yes, thank you. Yep. Any other discussion or questions? Tan? No, I think we're ready to vote. All right, Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett? No. Bevins? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. <clears throat> Erickson? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. That brings us to 9B, which is the adoption of a resolution awarding the sale of GO Bond Series 2020A. Uh, is this Connie? This is probably Paul. Probably okay. Paul. Yeah, take it away, Paul. Good, you can hear me. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of the council. I'm Paul Steinman with Baker Tilly. Uh, today, you uh, offered $3,880,000 in general obligation secured bonds, your Series 2020A. Uh, we took bids this morning at 10.30 a.m. And uh, on the bid tab that's in your packet, you had a total of about 30 interest. Has left the meeting. You had a total of about 30 interested uh, bidders. The winning bidder today uh, ro rolled up into nine total bids. Six, seven, yep, seven, eight, nine. The winning bid from UMB Bank today at 1.09%. Um, you have uh, you had some premium offered with your bonds, so you were able to reduce the amount that you uh, ultimately borrowed after we restructured your ultimate bond offering today was three million five hundred ninety five thousand. Um, and again, the winning bid from UMB Bank was one point zero nine percent. And I'll just finish uh, my presentation quickly with uh, some comments as I normally do on your uh, credit rating. We went before Standard & Poor's once again for uh, an hour interview about the city's economy, the city's finances, uh, the city's debt. Uh, um, and uh, once again, they affirmed your rating of double A minus with a stable outlook, meaning they're, they don't intend to change your rating. Um, over the next two years, unless something major to were to impact your rating. So, um, and they made a couple comments here. I'll read them quickly. The, the rating report is really good information for the council. Um, and I'm just reading just a small couple comments from it. But uh, so this rating from S and P reflects their assessment of your, the cities uh, of the city and the first bullet uh, is they they indicate you have a weak economy with a market value per capita of $55,428 and an effective buying income at 72% of the national level. Uh, you have strong management with good financial policies and practices. You have adequate budgetary performance with an operating surplus in the general fund. Erica has joined the meeting. You have very strong budget flex budgetary flexibility, very strong liquidity, weak debt and contingent liability profile, and a strong institutional framework score. So once again, they affirmed your double A minus um, stable, which is which is an excellent rating. Um, uh, the median rating in Minnesota is in the A category, so that that's an excellent bond rating. 
So I'll stand back for questions. Uh, my recommendation on, on the resolution this evening is to award the bonds to UMB Bank uh, at, at, a, at a true interest cost of 1.09%. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Paul. That is a great news on the interest rate. I was I was hoping for I was hoping for like almost twice that would have been good. I thought, but I don't know, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Paul, when I make the motion in two minutes, when Gabe calls on me, do I use the initial amount or the reduced amount? Um, the resolution states uh, specifically the reduced amount: three million five hundred ninety-five thousand. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? We've got another minute and a half before I call on Kelly for a, a motion. <laughs> Two minutes is, is kind of a relative thing. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Kelly. It's like dad's into the bathroom. Give me two minutes. Yep. <laughs> I'm ready for the motion, though. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we adopt a resolution awarding the sale of general obligation bonds, Series 2028. In the original aggregate principal, or no, in the reduced aggregate principal amount of three million five hundred ninety-five thousand, fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution, delivering, providing for their payment to uh, UMD financial or banking at the one point oh nine true interest rate, and I so move. Second. second. We have a motion by Bevan, second by Erickson. Is there any discussion? Kelly. I missed that. Thank you, Paul Steinman. Thank you. I didn't hear Kelly either. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Thanks again, Paul. Keep those interest rates down. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Okay. Ryder, gotta go up. Yep. Tab. Sorry, I'm just dismissing a child. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay, 9C, discussion on the work from home plan and the reopening of city facilities. Jennifer. So thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, as you heard from Paul and Kevin, kind of an update on the uh, city hall and where we are after the fire and where we are in the remodel. Um, so now that our offices are pretty much, we're ready to move into them, the glass partitions have been installed on second and third floor counters, and we've secured a sufficient amount of disinfecting and cleaning supplies. We are now recommending allowing uh, or starting to look at a way to open up City Hall. Um, we had a, our team met, uh, which includes Alderman Pritchett, to talk about what that could look like. And right now what we're recommending is that we do a controlled public access. Um, we would encourage the public to schedule appointments, but then also we would recommend installing kind of that well, uh, to the east and the south entrances where people could ring the doorbell and we would have people in City Hall that could see them um, on video and installing a release switch to the doors so that when somebody comes to the door, they would push the ring button. We would see them via video. We could let them in. Um, in front of each entrance, we would have uh, the health questionnaire, uh, the CDC guidelines, as well as masks and sanitizing uh, lotions so that they could, you know, disinfect coming in and disinfect going out. Um, do have those Zoom cameras cameras that were purchased, but we do not have the release switches to the door. Um, next on your agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about CARES Act funds, and those can be used for both the video doorbells as well as those release switches. Um, so we are recommending that for City Hall. Uh, well, we're still recommending that police department and fire department continue to be closed to the public and the board will decide on, on when and how to open uh, parks. 
Uh, the other thing that's included in your packet is the new city of Brainerd work from home plan. And as you can see with that, we're calling more people back to work on a rotating basis. So we're making sure that we have people at city hall so that we can um, have people letting people in and then directing people to the department that they are looking for when they come to city hall. So with that, Mr. Chair, we're asking that um, the council authorized staff to open city hall um, when we are equipped with controlled access and then to approve the revised city of Brainerd stay at home work plan to answer any questions as well as you know Alderman Pritchett who uh, said it on our team meetings as well as uh, any of the department heads as well with the discussion so thank you All right thank you Jennifer I'm, I'm ready for a motion Pritchett Mr. President oh Jan this I could we have some clarification um Jennifer said on the doorbell now when are those for the people that made an appointment or are those also including people that come and walk in? Thank you yeah, for that question, we... Jan, and it would be both. Um, both. We would encourage people to make appointments. And then of course, when they come to city hall for their appointment, they ring that they let them in. But of course we have contractors that are trying to pull up. Um, and so they also, if they're coming to our door, could ring the doorbell, we would see them and then we would uh, give access to the second floor so that James or Jason or Darren would be. Okay. And, and I have one more question, Mr. President. Um, and I understand uh, city council members are going to getting those badges. That's what they are, the badges. Mm -hmm. Now, um, is that when we get them, are we, um, are we allowed to go in or, or, or should we follow the doorbell thing? No, you have access. Once you get your badges, that FOB will allow you access to the building. I know a few council members do have theirs already and, and will for sure have all of them to you on the 13th. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Jennifer. You bet. Alderman Pritchett. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to move to authorize staff to open City Hall controlled access and approve the revised City of Brainerd stay at home work plan. Lambert, okay. second. Motion by Pritchett, second by Lambert. Any discussion? Jennifer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think just for clarification, we were hoping that our, our initial request was going to be asked this effective July 13th. The only thing that we are not prepared for is the remote access or the, the controlled access to the doors. And I don't know, Sean, if you have any information on how far out we are and being able to come and install that. I do not have a time frame. All right. I think what I heard Sean say is that he doesn't have that information yet. One of the things is we were waiting for council too. So we'll be waiting on that right away and we'll have a solid date available for the council as soon as we have that date. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. That brings us to 9D, which is the CARES Act funding. Jennifer, maybe? David, I don't know. Actually, I think Connie is taking this item. Thank Connie, you. Connie, there we go. Hello. On uh, June 25th, the Wealth Administration announced how it was going to distribute the federal COVID-19 relief funds to local governments. The City of Brainerd's allocation of the $841 million that the state received is $1,034,572. Staff has been working since June 25th when the announcement came out of how looking at the guidance and discussions on how this money can be used. The main thing about this guidance is that there are three distinct elements that have to be considered when determining if the COVID or the coronavirus relief funds can be used. The first one is it necessary and due to COVID-19, and they strongly recommended that municipalities document this fact. It has to be unaccounted for is the second one. So the expense wasn't part of the 2020 adopted budget. Another way of looking at this, that the cost cannot be lawfully be funded or it is substantially different from say what the line budget was intended to use for. 
And they've also been very specific that funds cannot be used to replace lost revenue. And the third amount, the third criteria is that the expense incurred between March 1st, 2020 and November 15th, 2020. The city did submit the, for the um, certification form to the Department of Revenue on June 29th, and we should receive payment approximately in eight to six days from that date. So really, this, this is informational tonight. No action is needed. Staff will return to the council on the July 20th meeting, detailing out the costs that have incurred to date, a list of items that the city could use the funds for, and an estimated amount to be used outside of the city for our constituents. So just kind of as a recap, um, Jennifer, do you have anything else to add or anybody have any questions? Well, the, only, the, only, the only thing I would have to add is there were very specific dates by which we could request the CARES Act funding from the state. Um, and so I know I talked to a few of you about just going quickly because if we did not on the 29th, our next opportunity would have been July 20th. So while we did ask the state for those funds already, um, we will not move forward with anything until council has approved it. Okay, any questions from the council? Mr. Ch Mr. President, this is Jan. Yeah. Um, on, well, uh, one question when Connie had said that we can do something in for the community. Does that mean more grants that we can use on that money to help our businesses or what? Yes, we can, if it's related to COVID. So I imagine we could do small business support grants for businesses that were affected by COVID and forced to be closed. Mm -hmm. Now, would we, I know before we had the, um, the clause that was for non, oh, if gambling was involved, that we they weren't eligible for these grants that we put up is that still going to be something that we're thinking of back to us with and it wasn't gambling it was it was non-profits yeah okay that's something the council will have to decide okay when we get there i mean i've been watching this since well, since the federal government spent the money in march you know it's been distributed in most other states already and a lot of them are doing the small business grant thing. A lot of them are reimbursing themselves for their PPE and customer service mm -hmm. counters and whatnot. I think we could reimburse ourselves for the grants we already sent sure. out, th that sure. grant money. But then I think we would totally be, I think it would be a, an appropriate use of funds to do more small business grants and perhaps expand the pool a bit to make sure we're catching everybody that was directly Objective. impacted with by covid you know so that would include the the, the elks or vfw or eagles okay. or Legion or other people that operate restaurants but weren't eligible for this last round well thank you for that consideration yeah. and the big thing is is that it has to meet those three criteria any money that we um, that we distribute or however we use it we have to make sure that it meets the federal guidelines um, which means it has to be COVID related, non budgeted, and, uh, and and during that time period. Jennifer, in a Mr. Chair, um, members also just I, I think our our plan is next on your July twentieth meeting. We'll at least have some detailed costs of what we have spent to date. Some costs that we anticipate. Um, frankly, one of the things that we could use this for are cameras. Um, we may have the franchise fee that we don't need to worry about it, but there may be other things that the council wants to consider going forward. And then also, I think digging into how we use the funds for small businesses um, will come at a subsequent meeting after the council says, yes, this dollar amount is what we'd like to spend for the city. Here is what we have left over um to do something for small businesses and and so i guess our our thought was we'd have that initial conversation with the council on the 20th and then come back in august to have the small business conversation all right yeah thank you jennifer and i was at jennifer and i were at the bpu meeting last week and we did ask todd to work with connie to get any unbudgeted expenditures they've they've incurred over over to the city too so we can account for that 
But I think this is just informational as of right now, we've got a million dollars that must be spent by November 15th and it must be COVID related. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, looking forward to seeing those recommendations. We're going to 9E, which is discussion on reestablishing the parking commission. Did uh, Bruce Buxton get back on here? He is on the call, yes. And Sean, you may. Unmute Bruce and I'll kind of open it up. I spoke to a downtown uh, restaurant business owner a few weeks ago and she was concerned about about parking downtown you know where some during the busy times for restaurants there isn't enough parking for the restaurants and whatnot so she was wonder she asked if the council could put together a downtown parking commission she was going to be here tonight has family in town for the fourth couldn't make it but really she just wants to put together a committee or have the council put together a committee of downtown business owners or people concerned about parking to kind of discuss the issue and bring recommendations to the council. And when I when I brought this up to Jennifer, she had a she had a what's her name? Stephanie look into it. And it turns out we used to have a parking commission. Jan Lambert actually served on it. And we mm -hmm. disbanded the parking commission almost 15 years ago. So maybe instead of creating a new downtown parking commission, we reinstitute the parking commission that we had created 20 years ago. And and we can probably get a quorum. There are interested people. There are people who are interested in talking about parking. So that, that's where we're at right now, Jan. The only thing I, rec uh, I would recommend, and I see we I said it in the uh, minutes, I would recommend that we reduce it to probably five. It is difficult. I mean, there's a, a lot of quite a few commissions that have seven, and we're having trouble getting those filled. And mm -hmm. I really think we should reduce that if we can to at least five. Okay. Would be I, something think I think that's smart. Then we could have a three person quorum as long as they can get three to a meeting. Correct. But we have Bruce is on the line. I don't know if anybody else or Bruce Buxton, you have thoughts on the parking commission? I, I think, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? I, we can hear you. Okay. I just, think that parking discussion around downtown is still a very viable issue that needs to be discussed because even though we've had COVID and, and business hasn't been exactly what we don't like it to be, uh, I think when it comes back and if we continue to revitalize and, and reinvest in downtown, we're going to need more parking and we need to figure out how best to provide that. Thank you. So I think, you know, David Chansky, you got some comments. I uh, just a, a few, Mr. President. I know, and Stephanie's digging. It came up that apparently the, the previous commission, how it was originally organized, was almost as a subcommittee of the planning commission. Um, so my question would be to council: Do you intend this to be, if you recreate it, to be an actual commission? Uh, a subcommittee of another commission, its own ad hoc. Um, and if so, uh, I know we as staff kind of discussed this a little bit of it being very kind of, especially if it's ad hoc, having a purpose. What is the purpose of this commission? What is their goal to solve? Um, and then so they, they have some direction. And once that direction is completed, either they get tasked with something new or be disbanded like before. Um, okay. We don't have another aimless kind of commission that just kind of sits there and meets but doesn't have direction. Yeah, my my discussion with the downtown business owners is I think I think the best thing would be an ad hoc committee. I like the five members and then direct them, maybe even give them our paid parking lots and have them give us the recommendation on those so we don't have to talk so much at council about those. But give them direction on giving a plan, a long-term plan or a short-term plan on downtown parking. But that that's what I thought. I brought it to you guys for discussion. So Kelly, what do you think? I think it's a waste of time. I think it's just like the commission that was put together nearly three years ago that hasn't met and hasn't made a recommendation to the council on the rental housing issues, particularly one house across from St. Francis School. I think if downtown business owners want to talk about parking, Purple fairies, 
or whatever, I don't care. Do it. I think they're responsible for their own businesses. And there's you can count the parking spots until you're blue in the face and talk about them until you're green in the face. But until you're ready to come up with an idea and bring it to the council, it's just talk. Go to the last turn saloon and talk. I don't I just think another committee and I'm worried that David Chansky's right on spot on target. If we don't say go fix this problem, gardens receptacles or whatever the problem is, then just go talk about it. I think it's great, but I don't know that we need another committee until somebody brings an idea that needs to be implemented to the council. Jan? Uh, Mr. President, I do strongly disagree with Alderman Bevins. Number one on the rental, it has been uh, uh, two years. These people have met twice a month on the rental, uh, Mr. President. And we wanted to have it done in May, as I mentioned last time, but with the COVID, we were unable. And we do have something to the attorney. So we have done some stuff. Um, so thank you for that. But the other thing on the parking commission, what I would like to see, how many times have we um, uh, tossed around, you know, do we need a parking ramp? Do, you know, uh, is there a parking, all that type of stuff. And that's what the planning, or I'm sorry, that's what the parking commission should be for. Um, to help take care of some of that. And I think uh, being a separate me committee at hoc meet committee would be beneficial. Um, so there is a need. I mean, as long as I've been here and as long as it was on the parking commission, we always had parking, parking, parking. And a lot of times they say it's a perceived, it's a perception. Well, a perception can be reality um, sometimes. So. I do think it's necessary. I do think if we reduce the uh, members um, and perhaps we might not have to meet every month, perhaps it could be due like on the transportation yet quarterly, but I do think it's important. Uh, so I thank you for that. Thank you, Jan. And, I, and I'll, uh, I'll back you up on your uh, rental housing committee. I celebrated the 4th of July with Rick Fargo and he, he seems to, think you guys are really close to the end and you have put a lot of time and work into it. But uh, any other council member thoughts on the reestablishing a parking commission as an ad hoc committee? Mr. President? Yeah, I'd be in favor of it, especially if we reduce the numbers and making an ad hoc. Um, as far as the timing of the meeting, if it's an ad hoc group, um, I'd recommend that they meet monthly and do their discussions, make their recommendations, and then let the council decide. And then maybe they get disbanded. So you know, you know, give them a time frame to say, you know, come together. You're an ad hoc committee. Meet monthly, make your recommendations, and then we'll go from there. Any other thoughts, Mr. Mr. President? It's Jan again. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, let's let Wayne. Okay, Mr. thanks. President, um, Back years ago, 20, 25 years ago, I served also on that parking commission and uh, we did accomplish some things downtown at the time and we were able to get some reinforcement of parking rules and uh, it seemed to help the parking situation a lot. And this is news to me that it was disbanded. I didn't know that, but it was very profitable back in the day when I was serving on it. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I'm ready to take a motion to to reinstitute, reestablish the parking commission. Jan. I will take make that motion, Mr. President, to reestablish the parking commission and I'll reduce the commission to five. I will second it. A motion by Lambert, a second by Wayne Erickson to. Reestablish a parking commission as an ad hoc committee with five members. Mr. President, one thing I noticed that um, there was not a council member on that commission, and do we do we necessarily need um, a council person on that commission, or is it by history that a council liaison would be on that commission? Like liaisons to commissions, just so we have a council seat at the table, but I don't know if it's a, any required. Okay. 
there any discussion on the motion to reestablish the parking commission? And I'll just say as a final rebuttal to Kelly, if we have five people who want to sit around and talk about parking and give us recommendations, let's give them the opportunity to sit around and talk about parking and give us the opportunity. No, no need to box them out when people want to be civically engaged. Kelly. They can do that without the commission. They could. Any other discussion? Lambert. Yes. Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Evans? Get a job. <laughs> I assume that is a no. <laughs> Absolutely. W. Erickson? Yes. E. Erickson? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that, that one carries. Next one up is employed guy to the seven. <laughs> F resolution improvement 1405 old Stonebridge trail final lift accepting the bid Paul. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this item is uh, we had a public hearing at the uh, couple council meetings ago for old Stonebridge, which is the final lift of where course that needs to go on that street. Um, staff did some research as was the council's desire to see what got ready on this. When we uh, did that research, we found that the original developer did place a $20,000 wear course escrow um, for that project. Um, and so uh, this was done to pay for the final lift of payment after 70% of the homes were to be developed. And so once that happened, they would have put the final lift on. That never occurred. And so therefore we're left with a, a street with one lift of pavement on um we solicited quotes from uh, our two paving contractors in the area knife river and anderson brothers um, they both have jobs with us this year so we got pretty favorable pricing uh, you can see knife river's quoted cost of sixty six thousand seventy three dollars to do the street um less the twenty thousand dollar wear course escrow brings us to about a forty six thousand dollar cost we had estimated about eighty thousand when we did our assessment notices so um, those assessments should drop drastically um, to the adjacent properties. Um, what we're recommending tonight is to accept the bid from Knife River in a total cost of $66,073. Um, and they are actually planning to do that work on Friday if this gets accepted tonight. So um, it'll get done quick and uh, we'll be able to move on. So um, that's what we're recommending tonight. Okay, any questions? Kelly, I'm ready for a motion. A motion. Thanks. Yep. Move to approve Knife River, sixty-six thousand seventy-three dollars. Assess it to the trans to the new parking commission. <laughs> Lambert second. <laughs> that gets seconded. <laughs> I was just kidding about that assessment to the parking. Commission. Uh, <laughs> friendly, am friendly amendment to assess it to the budding property owners. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I state that. the motion. Okay. Repeat the motion for me, Kelly. The motion is to accept the bid from Knife River at $66,073 um, and enter into our contract as such. There's nothing about assessments. Oh, there isn't. Okay. <laughs> second, Lambert. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Multitasking, and here we go. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Okay. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carries on to item number letter G. Food exemption. That's right, David Chansky. Thank you, Mr. President. Wade and Sabrina Andrew, they own all fried up LLC. Uh, their submitted request, their letter was attached in the packet uh, to locate their food truck in the former Papa John's parking lot, located at 400 Washington Street, one day per week. Uh, they are licensed with this city. Currently, you'll see them off many days a week uh, over by the Franklin Art Center. They're just looking to be able to kind of move around and get some different exposure um, throughout their week. 
Uh, right now, that location, the old Papa John's location, it is just outside a transient uh, food district. Uh, it's just outside right now. The the county government center is a district, and then downtown's a district. So it's just outside. It's on the other side of tracks of a district. So there's asking if council would consider exempting them and giving, allowing, essentially in a way, almost extending the district to allow them to locate one day per week uh, at 400 Washington Street. They do have permission from the property owner to locate there. Um, and they would still be able to meet pretty much all the other requirements. They have, uh, as I said, they have their license. They would be at least 300 feet from any other restaurant, which is a requirement in the ordinance. Um, so that's what they're just requesting at this time. I'll take any questions. Any questions? Mr. President Lambert again. Um, and this is mess, uh, for David. Uh, is would it be beneficial, especially what we learned with the COVID, that perhaps we need to relook at this ordinance um, on the the districts? You know, I think that's a good question. It's actually, something I, I brought to Mr. Bergman. I think that uh, uh, with COVID. Does it, how does it affect the food trucks is an interesting question. I think what you're seeing is actually with the with the cancellations of the state fair and pretty much every other county fair. I don't know of any fair that's going to be operating this year is food trucks are being a lot more creative and moving around. A lot of them would have just said, we're going to do the state fair. We're going to call it good for the year. And now, now they're getting creative and they're going all over the state and doing multiple different appearances. Um, I think it may be beneficial. Um, I can definitely, if the council would like, bring a recommendation of kind of maybe a temporary ordinance or a permanent or recommendation to change the ordinance if there's a desire to do that. Um, right now, again, uh, food trucks, uh, it's a $300 annual fee. We don't have a one time fee if someone wants to come up for just a day or two. And then they are uh, restricted to the areas that you see on your screen. Thank you, David. I I would just to follow up on that. I would support revisiting the overlay map at least temporarily, maybe permanently. I'm a little biased. I voted against the overlay map when we created it four years ago. But bringing something back during these times wouldn't hurt. Kelly, have a motion when you're ready. Any other discussion before a motion? Questions? No. Kelly, go ahead. Move to approve the request request for the year 2020. Second. Second to approve the exemption for the year 2020. Is there any discussion? Here we go. We'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. T. Erickson. Yes. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. That brings us to the next item on the agenda, which is the public forum. We'll open that up. We're at 939. Let's unmute some call in users. And if you are a call in user here for the public forum, please state your name and address. Erica Olson, 911 South 8th Street. Erica Olson, you are recognized. It is council policy to only take discussion for items that were not on tonight's agenda. Say that again. Cheryl Peterson, 1518 Quinn Street. Cheryl, we'll go with Erica Olson first and then we'll go with you, okay? So can Erica, you hear me I, I can hear you. I was just stating so you know that council policy is that we do not discuss in public forum items that were on tonight's agenda. So but I the floor discuss, is yours. I cannot discuss the situation with rain tonight. Is that what you're saying? That would be council policy. So what can I discuss? Anything that's not one of the 20 items on our agenda tonight. So, I'm I'm never going to be able to plead my case or have a fair anything with this situation. 
I'll tell you what, Erica, I'll give you three minutes, but that it's it is I am violating the rules of the city by allowing you to speak for this, speak to this for three minutes. But I am curious to hear what you have to say and go ahead and go, the floor is yours. All right. There did you all receive my email pointing out how the woman's testimony towards Rain being a dangerous dog was different from the testimony she gave to you? We did. Is there, is there anything about people lying in public forums? There's, there's no there. reason my dog. There's no reason my dog should be being dangerous. That situation, she lied clearly on this call with you guys before. Um, she made it way more out there than it actually was. Um, we're trying to get my dog. We've been trying to get my dog registered as a therapy dog, as a special needs dog for my son with PTSD. With this whole case, we can't do that. And we're hunting for insurance right now. And Rain doesn't need to be pulled. And we shouldn't have to be going through all these hoops to try and find the funds to keep our dog in our home and keep her out of heart and keep her from euthanasia all because someone lied. Our neighbor lied on this case and you all are allowing it and I feel like there's no fair trial. There was no evidence. There was no evidence she was even in that yard. I feel like I have not been listened to and I feel like myself and many others have had to move out of this town because of these situations. I know two other, three other women who are dealing with Situations concerning their animals that are unfair and unjust in this town, and no one is listening to them. I don't like. I could basically, I could easily say my neighbor's dog attacked me, and it never happened. But I could get away with it by what's happening right now. There were no marks on this dog. There were no pictures taken. There was nothing. No one saw this dog, and saw any injuries. And as far as an animal being deemed dangerous, they have to have attacked someone, they have to have actually done something really aggressive. Now, Mike O'Brien says that he witnessed her being aggressive. She has not ever been aggressive towards a person, but I can tell you that if somebody hit her with a pole, that would, that would elicit her any dog to be aggressive. And that in itself was an unfair justification for being even a potentially dangerous dog. This isn't right, it's not fair. And I've been crying every day for the past since this whole case because I feel like there is just everything working against us. No one is listening. No one cares. And all my city cares about is making money off my dog or taking her out of our home. She's not a bad dog. We have her secured. She's absolutely terrified to go anywhere near the fence now. She shakes. She will sit down. She's not moved paralyzed because she's so scared of the electric fence. We have the other perimeter that was asked of us to put in. We have done everything. We have gotten rid of our husky. We have complied with as much as possible. And we are not able to speak our point or say anything because no one will listen. This is not a fair case. She's not a bad dog. She's not dangerous. And we should not have to have all these restrictions on her. There is absolutely no evidence to her being a bad dog at all. There's no evidence she was even in that yard of our neighbors. Our neighbors are malicious. Their son bullies our son, towers over him. He pushes him around. He takes things out of his hands. We, we don't know what else to do. Their family is bullied these neighbors by us and every other neighbor, I could go around my entire neighborhood and get signatures from every neighbor saying and testifying to how they've met Rain, they love her, they think she is sweet. She interacts okay. great with everyone, including children and babies and people. Okay, thank you, Erica. We, we've, we've now heard you say your piece. I, I am at work right now and I'm on a break. So. I'm, try I'm trying to do this right now. You got okay, thank you. We, we have one more person for public forum. That's call in user six. So let's open up six and Cheryl Peterson, go ahead. 
Cheryl, are you still on the phone? Yes, I forgot to unmute. Sorry oh, about that. Um, I, I don't know how to twist this to make it seem as if it's not about something you've talked about tonight. I should be talking about my rescue, but at this moment, I am, I am absolutely livid. Um, I have followed this dangerous dog thing and it's, it's unfortunate. Um, what city council is doing, it's wrong. Um, no one online tonight has more experience with mastiffs and large dogs and dogs that have problems than I do. And I would like to see this turned around tonight before something worse happens to rain psychologically, emotionally, physically. Um, I don't know what Mike's intention is with this, but what I'm what I heard this evening, you know, I'm trying hard to stay away from the conversation. What I heard this evening wasn't more on, on, on the fact that this family with small children, not a lot of income, did everything that they possibly could to comply, which they did. And I followed it extremely closely, personally. Everything to comply. Uh, the insurance that they got, they were under the impression that it would cover rain if she left the property. No one is considering the fact that their home liability will cover her if she leaves the property. That always kicks in. Everyone knows that, or they should know that. Their car insurance liability will even kick in if something happens to her. We all should know that. Um, so, so Cheryl, she, this covered. item, Cheryl, this what item I, was on the to agenda say, tonight. Okay, this isn't what I'm going to say right now. Wasn't I question Mike's intention? Um, I know this this dog now um, is not a problem dog. I, I'm questioning Mike's intentions, and I don't want to do that because I do want to get along good with Mike. But I don't know if it's a dangerous dog under his arm. Um, let's, you know, let's get one for Brainerd. I, I don't know what that is, but she's not dangerous. I would like to see this dropped. I would like to see this, this, this family come back together calmly and enjoy their time with their dog and not worry about her going to heart where She's going to, she was there for a long time before. They adopted her out three times. Are you kidding me? They can't do that when they're holding a dog. Um, things were done illegally that shouldn't have been done. I don't trust Hart. I don't trust placing her there. She does not belong there. She, she needs to stay at home. I would like to see you discuss this further. They are, they are trying to get their money back on the insurance policy that they did get so that they can get the right one. Give them a chance. The 10 days or 14 days that she was given, no one, no one said those are business days. No, they just said those, so it, it was over the weekend. Um, they should have been given business days. Cheryl, Cheryl, you know what I'm saying? Cheryl, do you have I'm anything just, to discuss uh, that wasn't on tonight's yeah. agenda? Yes, there were underhanded things done. There were lies said. I heard the one neighbor say, "No, this that it was Cheryl, not rain." Cheryl, the dangerous Please, dog just situation. Reconsider. Cheryl, the dangerous dog situation was on tonight's agenda. Do you have something that wasn't on tonight's agenda to discuss? It wasn't on the agenda tonight that you need to reconsider this seriously and turn this thing around. That wasn't on the agenda. It needs to be reconsidered. The dog needs to stay at home. It needs to be dropped. Okay, Left do you have anything alone. else, Cheryl? I guess not. Thanks for dropping please, in. Please, please, please just listen to my experience and drop it. Thank you. Okay, so that will close the public forum at 9 50. Cheryl Peterson has left the meeting.
staff reports. Hey. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. I uh, just wanted to give you an update on the Region 5 Children's Museum. We do have a working group scheduled for July 6th. Uh, July 16th will be our first task force meeting. And then uh, the Region 5 Children's Museum will be hosting business after hours with the chamber on July 28th. So you'll be getting a request at your July 20th meeting. I just also, Connie's gonna share something on the screen, wanted to share this with you. Uh, the Downtown Business Coalition has raised some funds to do some banners downtown. Um, and uh, Jesse, our intern, worked with Chris from Minnesota Makerspace and came up with these um, banners that would go downtown, uh, trying to kind of build off the, we're here for good that the Downtown Brainerd um, Business Coalition is doing as well as your are you bet Erica you can. has left the meeting. So just wanted to share that with you. And last but not least, uh, July 13th at 6 p.m. at the fire department training room will be our goal session. This meeting will be no more than two hours. My goal is to have it done in an hour and a half where we can get through all the goals and strategies. And thank you all so very much for doing that survey. And that concludes my report, Mr. President. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other uh, department heads, David? Thank you, Mr. President. Just a few things here. Um, first of all, next uh, meeting on the 20th, I plan on giving a mid-year kind of update for the Community Development Department where we are at, especially on the building side. Uh, part of that in our last meeting, Alderwoman Lambert said, request if we have any data about what has been invested in downtown. I'll try to get some in there for that. Um, with that, of course, a lot of digging for that, but I'll try to put some numbers together for that. Um, I was in, got a, inform, informed over the holiday weekend that the Riverfront, uh, the LCCMR submission for the Mississippi Landing Trailhead has taken the next step and has been chosen to um, be presented before the LCCMR board. At this time, we're just waiting for a date for that presentation. Uh, originally, it's been pushed off uh, actually, at this point, twice now. Uh, originally, we were selected proposals were be presented at the beginning of July. Then it was pushed to the end of July, and now they're asking to push a little more. So probably sometime in August. Um, but we are starting now to be prepared for that. Uh, as of July first, uh, the city is officially has plumbing delegation to conduct all commercial plumbing plan reviews and inspections. Uh, so we are doing that now, which is great. It's great for our businesses that now they don't have to submit to the state and wait six to eight weeks. They can submit to the city and hopefully we can have you done in two to three weeks or sooner, depending on our workload. Um, with that, I just want to take the opportunity quick to shoot, to just uh, give some kudos to my building official, Darren Deseth. Our ability to really do this is because of him and his, uh, accreditation as a master plumber. This is not something he had to do when he was hired from the city and became the building inspector. This is something he brought up. Hey, I have this accreditation. We can, I, we, I can pursue this for the city. Um, so it's a great benefit to the city that because of Darren's experience and accreditation that we can do this delegation. Also online applications for building permits are fully going. We've been starting to get more and more online permits. We have set a date of October 31st as the deadline for paper applications. So kind of get us through this building cycle, start to teach our our um, contractors how to do the online applications and starting November 1st, we're gonna be online only for the most of our, uh, if not all of our applications. The last thing I have is a question for the council. Apologize if we didn't, I wasn't able to get this in the COVID, that's on me update is in regards to uh, rental inspections. If you remember back in March, um, when we all when we kind of closed things down, we ceased doing rental inspections. So as we're starting to open up the question is the council, would council like my staff to now resume uh, inspections? If the council would approve that tonight, my staff would start, uh, the, there's a notification process. So they'd start notifying the landlords and then scheduling those. So they would probably, the inspections themselves would be about, about two weeks out um, to actually being conducted. 
I, David, you, do you think your department is equipped? You have the face masks and gloves and whatever you would need to go into physical rental properties and inspect them? I think we do, and we've already been going into, you know, some homes for doing building inspections. So they have been using that PPE, so be very much the same. My staff already, when they went into these homes prior to COVID, was already using a lot of PPE, um, like like foot coverings and such, to ensure that if they're, if they're you know, we, they've experienced everything from bed bugs, fleas, et cetera, that they didn't take that with them as they left. So mm -hmm. I think they are prepared. Okay, would that be a council motion? I think as it was a council motion to end them, I think it'd be council council motion to resume. Kelly, move to resume rental housing inspections. Second. Second. Oh, sorry. Motion by Bevin, second by Stunick to resume rental housing inspections. Any discussion, Mr. Chair? Not, Kelly, just just just, and this really should go without saying, but I want to say it anyway. Taking the utmost care and precautions to protect our employees. I'll second that too. Discussion. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. He's sleeping. Pritchett. Yes. Bevins. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. P. Erickson. Yes. Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Anything else? That's, all I, have, that's all I have, Mr. President. All right, thank you. Any Tony? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just a highlight um, that I did put in the uh, final drawing for the Memorial Park project in your packet. Um, I'm going to be WSB tomorrow just to fine tune a few things at the site, uh, and then they'll be bringing uh, the information. Uh, for their final, uh, uh, for the things on what type of boards for the hockey rinks, things like that, to the June meeting. Um, the, they hope to have the bids let by August 1st, and um, a kind of tight time frame because uh, I've asked that uh, the uh, hockey rinks and warming house be uh, completed by December 1st so we can start flooding this winter. Um, just a couple highlights uh, is that you'll notice that there's five pickleball courts that will be uh, used uh, in the one rink for summer use. And I did talk to the pickleball players, and they were incredibly thankful to the city council for doing this, for providing the funding for it. Um, I've talked to uh, the Brainerd Basketball Association. They're interested in using the smaller court uh, for summer leagues and things like that. And... Um, uh, also, I talked to a member from Baja today, and they're asking about potentially uh, uh, reserving ice during the winter with these uh, new rinks. So um, being a multi-purpose is going to be very beneficial, uh, getting uh, summer and winter use out of them. Um, once the bids are let and we see what the prices are, um, the obviously is the warming house with the attached pavilion and the hockey rinks and then uh, seeing how much funding is left over then we're looking at the other portions that are uh, uh, indicated on the line that you received great news kelly may i ask a question of parks director sailor please yes thank you hey tony i see on the um on the drawings which thank you for that of uh, the splash pad and i i just I, i've probably had more comments on that in the last week than the weather. And the concern is that any of the money that we bonded for this evening, to make sure to remind you that none of that has been committed to the splash pad. That's a private enterprise. And I know there's a lot of people that would be disappointed if we took public money that was not dedicated to the splash pad and took it away from Memorial Park or even any of the existing park issues. And I'll be very specific, the Gregory Park Fountain, which was cobbled together four years ago and works at about 10% of what it did five years ago. I know that there would be some, there, there might even be, oh, I can't imagine what could happen to a, to a parks director who sent bond money to this flashback. 
Uh, right now, the uh, uh, the splash pad committee has raised uh, a little over eighty thousand dollars, and um, uh, there were a, a, a member of the park board that did uh, say, "Gee, we might want to go to the city council and ask for some funding for that." And um, that hasn't been specifically decided if the park board's going to do that or not. Um, I, that is still kind of up in the air, but um, we're hoping that uh, people will still continue to donate to the uh, committee. And um, uh, the thing about a splash pad is it it could go anywhere from 100,000 to 500,000. It just depends on what amenities you put in it. So um, there's, a, there's a wide range of what could be in there. And um, so I, I'm reaching out and asking the community uh, and businesses, service clubs, if they would like to uh, find a real nice project is to donate towards that splash pad. Thank you. Thank you. Any other department heads? Seeing none, we'll go to the mayor's report. Mayor's report over, the best report yet. Council member reports, Kelly Bevins. Hey, those are some nice fireworks. Oh, the mayor wanted me to say that. <laughs> Mr. President. Yeah. Actually, the mayor did ask me to share. I just couldn't unmute quickly enough. He just oh. wanted to share that he really would like to thank everybody uh, for the 4th of July. He said that fireworks went extremely well. Um, our people who were watching the fireworks were all very respectful. Um, he just could not, ha he didn't have enough good things to say about how well the fireworks went. He just wanted me to make sure that I passed that along to the council. Thank you. Anything else, Alderman Bevins? None. Alderman Pritchett? Got nothing. Alderman Lambert? I have a couple things. Um, one, again, I'll, I'll really reiterate on the fireworks is fantastic. Um, and then I have, have had some uh, questions posed to me. Is the city going to um, make masks mandatory? That's one of the, I'm getting that question. So I just want to pass it on, let people know that that's what um, I've been hearing out in the community. So um, just some food for thought. I don't I'm just passing it on. I'm not expecting anything today. So thank you. Thank you, Lambert. Alderman Stunick. I've heard the same comments about mass mandatory or voluntary. I'll leave it at that. Other than that, I have nothing else. Tad Erickson. Yeah, it's a really brief committee update. Um, so Northland Arboretum. Uh, as you can imagine, their membership's a bit down uh, due to COVID, uh, I, as they suspect. However, they do have a new staff who's kind of emphasized recruitment of new members. And so since they've come on, they've actually got new, nine new members. So that's a little positive note there. Uh, several other administrative things grants are applying for. Uh, so they're doing good work. Uh, in addition to that, Fire Advisory Board, the May meeting uh, was canceled due to COVID. Uh, next meeting coming up uh, in August. Uh, and then lastly, the Riverfront Committee. Um, regrettably, I wasn't able to attend that meeting, but from David and Mike Grant, the LCC Mayor Grant, uh, progressing nicely uh, as of now. So that's all for me. Thank you, Tad. Wayne Erickson. Just very proud of the police department and Brainerd and how they handled things over the 4th of July during the fireworks. I'm just uh, extremely proud of the police department and the way things are handled. That's all. Thank you, Wayne. I, I've got a handful for you guys. Uh, I've been hearing the mask talk too. I, I have no interest in making masks mandatory, but I am absolutely interested in encouraging everybody to wear a mask when they are out in public. I was up in two harbors in Duluth last week and there are about two to three times as many people wearing masks up there than are here. It seems we're pretty lax in our community and, and we should be wearing masks, but I have no interest in mandating it. I met with the BPU last week. The power costs this year, according because of our new agreement, are way down. So electricity, we're buying at a good rate as was planned, and we should be able to see some relief in our bills in upcoming budget years. Uh, uh, Paul, Corky, this one's for you guys. There were... 
bunch of cars egged in southeast Brainerd last night. It may be extending over even into South Brainerd. I've heard uh, I've heard of upwards of a dozen egg containers out in the street, and uh, there are some people who have nest videos from their front doors who have the car if, if you need that, Corky. And Paul, if you have the capacity to send the penguin down around southeast tomorrow to clean up some eggshells, we'd really appreciate it. Will do. And then uh, one final thing. It happened tonight just out of the blue, but I, I've talked to a couple other citizens about it, wondering why we have our public forum at the end of our agenda, where a lot of public entities have it at the beginning of their agenda. So maybe we want to consider moving that. Secondly, some public entities allow items that are on the agenda, and some don't, and we don't. And I've, I've had two people who, who were not here tonight, two people ask me that, and I don't know why, and I don't have a good reason. So we may want to consider changing our agenda, or, or maybe we don't want to because there are good reasons I, I can't think of. But that's all I have, and uh, we'll... I'd like the motion to adjourn to adjourn to our council work session at the fire department at 6 p.m. next Monday. So move. Our second. Second. second by Lambert. Any discussion? That's at the fire department. Fire it department, is 6 p.m. Masks not required. Highly encouraged. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Okay. You betcha. Bevins? Aye. W. Erickson? Yes. T. Erickson? Yes. Ian Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. We're adjourned. We'll see you all next week. Good night, all. Good night.